Good evening, everyone. My name is Carla McCanders. I direct the Thurgood Marshall Institute with the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. I'm joined here by Ashley Fox, a Marshall Motley Scholar and my former student and the editor-in-chief of the new Social Justice Reporter, um, our co-sponsor for our Voting Rights Roundtable in the South and our community conversation. We're thrilled to welcome you here to this important discussion to, on protecting and advancing voting rights in the South, which is, in the South has historically been the focal point of voting rights for Black Americans. Before we begin, I would like to recognize any elected officials, judges, or dignitaries in the off, um, audience, if you could stand up so that we can recognize you. Thank you, Justice Earls. As we begin the round table, I would also like to thank the Social Justice Reporter staff, Vanderbilt Law School's Office of Student Affairs, particularly Deans Chris Myers and Yesha Yadav, as well as Jenny Stump, Morgan Peck, LDF, and the Thurgood Marshall Institute staff, of course, the director, Carla McCanders, and Lauren O'Neill in particular, who have worked. Thank you. who have worked tirelessly to make this roundtable a reality. As we gather here today, it's also important to reflect on the rich history of nonviolent protests in the South, particularly in Nashville, Tennessee. As we convene, it's imperative to reflect on the profound history of nonviolent protests, oops, excuse me, <laughs> in the tumultuous spring of 1960, I'll tell you about those nonviolent protests, Reverend James Lawson, a young pastor and civil rights leader, faced expulsion from Vanderbilt University Divinity School for organizing lunch counter sit-ins and other nonviolent demonstrations against racial injustice. This event ignited a firestorm of protest, leading to faculty resignations and nationwide media attention. This critical moment in Nashville's past underscores the enduring power of nonviolent protests as a catalyst for change. Reverend Lawson's steadfast commitment to justice serves as a testament to the bravery and resilience of those who fought for civil rights in the South. So as we engage in discussions on voting rights in the South this evening and at tomorrow's roundtable, we must draw upon the insights of history and honor the legacy of those who paved the way. We are privileged to have a distinguished group of speakers and moderators with us, and we anticipate a very productive dialogue. So without further delay, I will now turn the floor over to Dr. Herbert Marbury, Associate Professor of the Hebrew Bible and Religious Studies at Vanderbilt Divinity School to introduce our esteemed panelist and moderator. Thank you. all right Good evening all. And I, I greet you from the James Lawson Institute for Research and Study of Nonviolent Social Movements at Vanderbilt University. This evening, we're gathered here during the 60th anniversary year of Reverend James M. Lawson's expulsion from Vanderbilt University. In 1960, Reverend Lawson was a senior divinity school student who had come to Nashville at the request of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He'd come to train students from Vanderbilt, Fisk, American Baptist College, and Tennessee State University in the practice and philosophy of nonviolent direct action. This moment was the birth of the Nashville student movement. Both Reverend Lawson, and Reverend King were convinced that social change, especially addressing racial injustice and social inequality, could only occur through nonviolent strategies. At that time, Jim Crow laws enforcing segregation and racial discrimination prohibited blacks from eating at lunch countertops and was considered the norm. Reverend Lawson prepared students to disrupt business as usual by sitting at the countertop 
even in the face of disrespect, the refusal of service, violence, and arrest. The effects rippled across Nashville and made national headlines. The university requested that Reverend Lawson stop his trainings and sit-ins. And when Lawson refused, on March 3rd, just two months before he was to graduate, he was expelled. And many of you know that this set in motion a still unfolding process of moral deliberation by Vanderbilt University's faculty. At the Divinity School, 16 faculty members resigned, and some faculty from across the university threatened to follow suit. It was a powerful catalyst to push the university to take racial injustice and social inequality seriously, and eventually to begin to reconcile with Reverend Lawson and its past. These 60 years later, we're, on, we're still on the path. This event this evening reminds us that the work toward creating a more just society is far from over, and its success requires all of us, every single one of us. So I'm pleased that we gather to say yes to the call, the call that is ours, the call that is for our future. And so now I'm pleased to introduce our panel. Let me begin with our moderator, Khalil Ekelona. I think all of Nashville knows him by voice. Even if we, some of us are meeting him for the first time by face. <laughs> Khalil Lokalona's life story is one that is based on curiosity and authenticity. Growing up in the suburbs of Baltimore gave him the opportunity to enjoy both the carefree days of youth and the vibrancy that is city life. While attending Elon College, now Elon University, he began to hone his voice and leadership skills through his activities in student government. He then made a shocking decision. He pursued the creative arts rather than a career in politics that many, including himself, believed he was destined for. That choice brought him to Los Angeles in the late 1990s. There, he became a founding member of the hip hop group Fresh Air, that is your favorite group that you've probably never heard of. And he entered the world of education. It was his years, at, as years teaching at an alternative high school for at-risk teens that gave him a deeper perspective on the connections of humans and our shared problems and joys. In his travels, he's learned more about what connects us and what we, as human beings, desire most for ourselves and our loved ones. Moving to Albuquerque, New Mexico, he was able to reconnect himself and ask the question that many of us either stray away from or obsess over. That is, what is my purpose? Khalil Ekelona, welcome. Our first panelist is no stranger to us. He is always at the ready whenever injustice raises its ugly head and has been here in Nashville several times, and we know what it means to live in Nashville and to face injustice in the ways that we do. Reverend William Barber II is an American Protestant minister, social activist, and professor in the practice of public theology and public policy and founding director of the Center for Public Theology and Public Policy at Yale Divinity School. He is president and senior lecturer at Repairers of the Breach, which he is here tonight representing, and co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. Reverend Barber also serves as a member of the national board of the NAACP and is the chair of its Legislative Political Action Committee. From 2006 to 2017, Reverend Barber served as president of the NAACP's North Carolina State Chapter, which is the largest in the southern United States and the second largest in the United States. He pastored Greenleaf Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, in Goldsboro, North Carolina from 1993 to 2023. Welcome, Reverend Barber. Yeah. 
And I believe now that's Bishop Barber. <laughs> Our second panelist is Janae Nelson. Janae S. Nelson is President and Director Counsel of the Legal Defense Fund. the nation's premier civil rights law organization fighting for racial justice. Nelson formerly served as LDF's associate director counsel and was one of the lead counsels in VC versus Abbott in 2018, a successful federal challenge to Texas's voter ID law and the lead architect of MUL versus Trump 2020, which sought to declare President Trump's executive order banning diversity, equity, and inclusion training in the workplace unconstitutional before it was later rescinded. Welcome, counselor. And now it is my delight to turn the conversation over to our moderator, Khalil Ekelona. Turn my mic on, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, pleasure, how are you both doing today? Great. Wonderful. Great. Glad to be here with you. Wonderful. All right. We, I want to. I just want to get started by just generally asking you both questions of one thing that I do in my show when I talk to folks is why? Why do you do what you do? Janae, why civil rights? Could we start with a broader question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, why do I do what I do? Um, in a different way from, from the Reverend here, this is a calling, but maybe not in such a different way. But this is a calling for me, and the this is the calling of racial justice to uh, right the wrongs that I perceived from as long as I think I had any ability to observe the world. I saw that something was askew, something was out of balance, something was deeply unfair and unjust, and I uh, didn't quite know exactly how to tackle it or what to make of it or why it was even that way, but I knew that it didn't sit well with me. And over the course of my lifetime, I came to uh, understand the law as a powerful tool to change the conditions of black people in this country. And frankly, you know, in, throughout the world. Um, and the right to vote wasn't always... Uh, the tool of choice that I thought of, but I have also come to appreciate the power in voting, especially as a nonviolent means of transformation. And so I, I do what I do because I just can't resist it. it it's, it's just something that is in me. Thank you. Reverend Barber, why, why do you focus on voting rights and civil rights advocacy? Well, first of all, thank you for having me, and thank you for this um, Vanderbilt and all of us who've gathered here uh, on today. And here comes Justin. He's just getting off the Justin. floor. He had eight bills. Yeah. He is an active legislator. Um, I was born August 30th, 1963, two days after the March on Washington. And the going um, thing in my family was that my mother went into labor on the 28th, and I said, wait a minute, let's <laughs> slow this down and see what happens. August 28th was the March on Washington. 17 days later, they were blowing up babies in churches. And my parents asked the question, what kind of world have we brought our child into? And what kind of world must we seek to make it? And so my parents left middle-class status, opportunity, upward mobility, and went back to the South my father's home, to help desegregate schools that Janelle had, was still not desegregated as late as 1968, 69. And they took their only child and put me in segregated public schools. I was headed to integrated public schools in Indianapolis, but they made a decision. So I, so I was kind of thrown into the movement without even choice. But then as I grew, I learned from my father and learned from teachings of scripture that there's no way to say Jesus without saying justice. And that any attempt to do so is a form of heresy. It's contrary to, to what it means to be a person of faith. And then the, sec the second reason and two more, one, the ne next reason, third reason is that um, when you think about life, you know, COVID has taught us that breath is 
is a is a great commodity because you know six minutes of it if you don't have it for six minutes you, you're out of here most of us and the real question is what are you going to do with your six minutes or your six hours or your six days and i come up in a tradition that says the measure of your life is not your title but your testimony and your testimony is what did you do for others what did you do to make the world a better place and then lastly me theologically as a professor of theology for voting rights particularly Voting rights is not just something a constitution grants us. Um, in the Hebrew scriptures, actually, the word for vote and the word for voice are the same word. And so God commands us to lift our vote and our voice. God gives human beings a choice. That's why we don't give the right to vote to puppies, parakeets, and pets. We give the right to vote the human beings, 18 years or older, born or naturalized in these United States. But it's ultimately a God-given right to make a choice. And then anybody who tries to take that right, they're suggesting you're not human. They're suggesting that you were not made by God, that you're less than, just because the right to make the choice comes from the creator. The word is coil, by the way. And there are hundreds of scriptures in the Bible that says, lift your voice like a shofar, call shofar, lift your voice like a trumpet. You could actually say, lift your vote like a trumpet. Huh? And so God expects us to make choices and to always choose righteousness over unrighteousness. So for me, it's, it's deeply theological and moral as to why we do this work. Thank you. Uh, we have our last panelist, all you may know, Justin Jones, State House Representative from Nashville. Justin, thank you for being here. Tell, you know, I've been trying to get you on the show, so I'm going to ask you the question I wanted to ask for a minute. Why? Why are you doing what you're doing? Well, first of all, I just want to say it is an honor to be here with two giants in, in the civil rights movement and with my brother here. Um, who's been amplifying what's happening in our city and, and, and across this region in the South. I literally just ran over from the House floor. We were there for three hours. And um, we're talking about voting rights. It's ironic because every bill tonight that was controversial, um, my Republican colleagues shut, up, um, shut off debate and would not allow us to really debate the bill and call the question and force the vote um, by taking away our voting rights. And when they do that, they take away the voices and the votes of 70,000 people who we represent. And so we're in a state that we know is... Um, the way it is because we are dealing with folks who cheated their way into power. Um, in Tennessee, one in five black men cannot vote because of felony disenfranchisement. Um, we cannot use a student ID card to vote, but we can use a gun permit to vote. Uh, we're in a state um, where it's easier actually to get a gun than it is to, to vote. You know, you have to show an ID at the polling place, but you don't have to show an ID if you buy an assault weapon. Um, and, and that's insane, morally insane. And uh, the reason I do what I do is because... Um, I know the legacy in which we stand. I, I know that this is personal. Um, voting rights was the first issue that I ever got active in when I was a student at Fisk University. I was so excited. I came when I was 17 and, and registered to vote um, and was really excited to vote at Fisk. And that's when they passed the voter ID law, uh, the law that made it so that we could um, not vote without a Tennessee state ID. And our student ID cards were not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And some people say, well, that makes sense. You know, show this. But the thing is, if you're living in a dormitory, uh, you don't have a utility bill. You don't have a water bill. And so there's all these barriers being put up to stop us from voting um, in 2013 and 2014. And the reason why was because they were so scared of what happened in 2008 and 2012, where we had a 51% youth voter turnout across this nation. We saw a movement of young people rise up, and they were terrified of our power. And so we organized students at Fisk and TSU um, and Vanderbilt and Belmont, and we actually filed a lawsuit against the state of Tennessee um, over their voter ID law. Um, and it's a fight that continues to this day. Um, and, and, and so I guess for me, too, it's just recognizing that uh, we are in a, in a state that has this dual history. Uh, we're the state that is the birthplace of the KKK, um, but we're also a state that's the birthplace of the Nashville student movement where young people like Diane Nash and Bernard Lafayette and C.T. Vivian and Rip Patton, for those of you who know um, Mr. Rip Patton, and um, King Holland, some of the elders we've just lost recently, uh, rose up to say that we are not going to um, accommodate and, and, and be conformed to a world that treats us as second class and, and treats us as um, unequal. And, and we must, you know, at Fisk University, one thing, you know, I, I remembered 
thinking was that um, we can't just talk about the history, but we must fight against um, the forces who are trying to bring us back in that history um, because, you know, we're in a time that is really um, a crossroads in, in, in our state and in our nation. And I do believe, because um, a lot of people have been saying, you know, well, you know, it, it's hard in Tennessee. Even last year when we got kicked out the legislature, a lot of family, people who, who, who love me, I know, were like, you should just leave. It's, it's dangerous. People don't realize what's happening here. But I do believe that if we can transform a state like Tennessee, then we can transform this nation. Right. And that Tennessee is worth fighting for. I'd like, I'd like to talk about the role of the black church and civil rights lawyers in establishing and creating voting rights 60 years ago. But more specifically, how those strategies have to be adapted and evolved to be effective in 2024. The situation we're in is entirely different, yet we're facing the same problems. Um, Janae and, and then Reverend Barber, what do you think we have to do to evolve the strategies and the foundations that were built back then from the black church, from black attorneys like yourself? Yeah, well, the black church has always been so central to the black community, not just as a space of spirituality, but a place of gathering, a place of strategy, a place of community. It was one of the few free spaces that we had and where our leadership could ascend without having to contend with the barriers in other spaces. That was our space and is our space to this day. I think that if we look at the trends across the country, you know, many people are not attending church in the same way that they used to. Uh, there is less of a religiosity as, as much as there was before. And that just means that the church needs to continue to meet people where they are it needs to go beyond the congregation and into the community. And that's always been, I think, the philosophy of the black church, that it hasn't seen itself solely and strictly as a, a theological uh, repository, but more so as an active engager with community. And that is necessary in this moment as much as any other. And we would be remiss if we overlooked the role of the church and disrespected the history that it has um, the role it has played in the history of evolving voting rights over time. Right now we have robust programs out of many churches like Souls to the Polls, where even if you aren't a member of a congregation, you come together for that communal collective act of casting a ballot along with other people who share your interests uh, in a way that can potentially transform the conditions of your community. So we need to make sure that when we talk about activism, that we talk about all the spaces in which activism occurs and that we can talk about churches, we can talk about other religious centers because we are diversifying in terms of the religions that many people in the black community adhere to. But the church symbolizes community. It symbolizes a, a connectivity among people that is something we need to tap into as much as ever before. When you look at scripture, which is the basis of the church's move um, and basis of religion, whether it's a black church or churches that's predominantly black or churches that are not predominantly black, there are 2,000 scriptures in the Bible that speak to how we should treat the least of these, how we should stand on the side of justice and righteousness. If you cut all of those scriptures out, the Bible falls apart. Now, but there's a curious history here of the church, even the black church, because recently the Pew Foundation did a study of 50,000 sermons to study what was being preached in the uh, American church. <clears throat> uh, they found that the thing that Jesus talked about first was good news to the poor or good news to the patokos, that's a Greek word, which means those who've been made poor by economic injustice, uh, did not register 1% of the sermons out of 50,000 sermons. They said that in the so-called predominantly white church, the thing people were hearing the most was about doctrine. In the so-called black church, praise and worship. Uh, that troubles me because if we lose the prophetic voice of the church that is supposed to be challenging injustices, you know, in Jeremiah chapter 22 says, go down to the palace, the power, and tell them to stop injustice. You know, Jesus said, 
that you can do all of the ritual you want to, Matthew 23, 23. But, but if you don't do deal with justice and faith and mercy, you've left undone the weightier matters of the law. Another text says, we will be judged by how we treat the least of these. Now, the curious history, and I can say this as a bishop and as a pastor, let us not forget that there is not this thing called the black church. It has many pieces. Dr. King was put out of his denomination. That's why you got the progressive Baptist group. The, the people that formed the SLC, SCLC were a, 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 a remnant of preachers that had been put out of various denominations. Let's not forget that, right? But that's also biblical because the Bible teaches us it's the remnant that makes it better for the masses. The, one of the things, but the church role has to be, first of all, to raise the moral critique. Not the, Our voice should not be about what's left and what's right what's conservative versus liberal, but what's right versus wrong. We have to raise the moral critique, which is why, for instance, at the end of the Selma to Montgomery March, and isn't it interesting that they left a church and went to the bridge and were beaten and came back and then went back. But at the end of the Selma to Montgomery March, which I think is Dr. King's greatest sermon, by the way. I think I have a dream is his greatest closing. But the sermon, at the, well, his truth is marching on at the end of the Selma to Montgomery, when he did it, knowing that he could be shot at any time standing on those steps of the Alabama State House. He said that the greatest fear of the greedy, racist oligarchy in this country is for the masses of Negroes and the masses of poor white folk to come together and form a voting bloc that could fundamentally reshape the economic architecture of the nation starting in the South. He didn't see voting rights as just a black issue. He saw voting rights as opening up the possibility of fusion coalitions that would bring people together around economic issues and it would transform uh, the South. Lastly, the church has to challenge right now this so-called religious nationalism that is a form of heresy and non uh, irreligion uh, that basically says that the, 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 a God agenda is guns, uh, Republican, uh, abortion, being against abortion, being against gay people, and uh, 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 being for tax cuts. That, that that is, has nothing to do with the God agenda. And the church has to be aggressive in this moment in declaring that is heresy and lifting up and being engaged. When we did voting rights, the last thing, when we did, when we, when we um, had to stand in Mall Monday against the worst voter suppression bill after the Shelby decision, the Shelby decision gutted Section 5. On June 25th, 2013, don't ever forget that day, because that's the date that we, we went backwards. We, got, we have less voting rights since June 25th, 2013, than we had August 6th, 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was first passed. We filed a lawsuit within 40-some minutes, and we actually won. They actually proved that they were engaged in racism with surgical intent. We won all the way up to Supreme Court. But one of the ways we won was churches became plaintiffs and their members were plaintiffs and veterans were plaintiffs and students were plaintiffs and white women were plaintiffs. We were able to show that racism attacks black people, but it has collateral damage. When those churches were willing to sign on as plaintiffs, that was huge. They were saying that we aren't going to sit on the sidelines. And if there's anything the church has to do today is the church can never sit on the sidelines as long as evil is on the front line. Thank you. Thank you for that. You know, uh, just a few weeks ago, 59 years ago, was Bloody Sunday in Selma. And thinking about that, that moment, 600 people attacked. How do the events then resonate today, seeing that, as you just so eloquently stated, Reverend Barber, we have more voting rights 
to those days than we do now. Seeing the rollback of this, this is what Representative Jones is fighting and his colleagues are attempting to fight, continuing to get rolled back. How are those events visible today, seeing what we're facing in November of 2024? And I'm open to anyone who'd love to answer. Um, I think, I mean, something that we've tried to be cognizant of in my office is that um, those same voice, you know, we have the more sophisticated forms of voter suppression. We have overt intimidation also happening as well. Um, just a few months ago, the Proud Boys showed up outside our Capitol trying to intimidate lawmakers from voting against common sense gun laws. Uh, two weeks ago, we had um, guys come outside the Capitol, AR-15. A month ago, we had neo-Nazis marching actually right down this street right here um, and, 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 and lifting up that spirit of, of, of violence. And so I think, you know, these acts of violence are, are not, I mean, January 6th, these are not things that are just historic, but they're, they're contemporary examples. And I think we have to be cognizant of it, but not intimidated by them and to stand um, with that moral clarity to be able to speak up and to, and to speak truth um, and to let these forces know that we come from a, a legacy of liberation that, that undergirds us. And, and I think um, these anniversaries are so important um, but I think, you know, more so than a, than a historical date, um, it's really a call to action. Um, it's something that should trouble our spirit and, and, and agitate us to act. Um, and, and, you know, here, our capital, we're on the intersection. We have John Lewis Way and MLK um, Boulevard. That's where our capital sits. And they were so proud to name these streets after civil rights leaders. But to me, they should, they should be, there should be something convicting about passing those signs as you enter a capital where we're rolling back voting rights we're rolling back civil rights every day. Um, just today on our committee, they voted, they're trying to um, um, water down the Tennessee Human Rights Commission, which is, in, which is in charge with enforcing civil rights, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Fair Housing Act. And we're, they're trying to water it down because they say that we don't need it, we don't have discrimination essentially is what they're trying to tell us um, when, we can, when we know what's happening before us. And so I think those things should just convict us and motivate us and agitate us um, to stand in that legacy of courage. Um, even when, when we're not, I'm going to have everyone on our side because in that day, I think we romanticized the civil rights movement that every, every church was a part of it. Even here, I mean, everyone you know, wants to talk about how they're a part of the civil rights movement. When I talked to mentors like Diane Nash, she said the young people were told, you are being too radical. You're asking for too much. Settle for segregating half the lunch counter. And they said, no, uh, we are going to make ourselves people who cannot be segregated. Whether the law changes or not, we're going to show them the type of world we're fighting for. And, and, and our, one thing that I'll just end with this that has, has stuck with me has kind of been a mantra because as Rev knows, you know, when this work, death threats, these things are real. These are things that we're dealing with. My, my chief of staff is here. We, we, we have to talk about safety seriously. And Diane Nash, I'll never forget, she told us this when I was a student. Um, she said that we went on those freedom rides um, after the Anderson bombing. We had our wills written out. Uh, we were prepared for the ultimate sacrifice because we were thinking about your generation. Because even though we had yet to meet you, we still loved you. And I think that type of love that transcends generations where you're willing to, first, to face the worst of this nation, the worst of the South, the worst opposition possible, I think that is something that should be undergirding in this time, is, is what will our legacy be for future generations? I'll come back to that question. I want to say something, but go ahead. I just want to say they are unrepresented. How do you lead a group of people being the top attorney? How do you fight that when folks are refusing to listen to the Supreme Court, the highest court in our land? To me, that's mind boggling. Um, it's kind of crazy. How do you go about doing your work seeing that this is where these people are living in their reality? So I'll connect that to the, to the previous question in terms of drawing strength from the history and those who came before. Every year, our staff, some of whom are here tonight, uh, we go to Selma and we reenact the march across the bridge. 
And for us, it's not just symbolic. It's not just to pay homage. It's to recognize what it takes to actually drive change. And as you said, the type of sacrifice, the willingness to put your body on the front line, and that can come in many forms. It can come in protest. It can come in the form of uh, challenging structures, knowing that you are going to get a backlash that could result in threats, that could result in uh, challenges to your livelihood, to anything. When I think about the sacrifices that our clients made in the seminal case, Brown versus Board of Education, that we're celebrating as of May 17th, it will be 70 years old. And there are people living today who segregated and integrated schools, who went to segregated schools even after Brown was passed. And the fact that they were willing to put their children in those positions, that they were willing to stand up and fight is how we keep the motivation. And I say we because as a leader of this heralded institution, I don't do it alone. I do it standing on the shoulders of my predecessors, my seven predecessors who are all luminaries in their own right. I do it by working shoulder to shoulder with my staff, who is absolutely incredible. You could not ask for a more dedicated and, and brilliant set of people. But really, I do it for the people who the communities that we are so honored and privileged to serve, who, whether they are in the civil rights movement directly or not, um, are, are people who are often mounting their own protests on a day-to-day -day basis in their workplaces. They're speaking out. They are contacting us with some of their problems, and they're giving us the, the stories that we can then take to these uh, these tribunals, whether they're courts, whether they're legislatures. Uh, and if they don't respond, we also have organizers who can help our communities go into the streets or organize themselves in different ways to make sure that there is some degree of accountability. What the Legal Defense Fund has had to do over the 80 years that we've been in existence, almost 85 now, is recognize that law alone will not do the job. And we've known that. But we have really had to build out the other tools that we use, like research, like the Thurgood Marshall Institute that's hosting this incredible forum, research and organizing and policy work. So we come at it from all angles. And one of the most important resources we have is getting people educated about these issues and getting them motivated. And we saw that happen in 2020 when people responded to the killing of George Floyd, the killing of Breonna Taylor, the killing of Eric Garner. If we think back to Selma, it was the killing of Jimmy Lee Jackson that really was the spark. It, the movement was already happening, but that was the spark that really lit the flame for that march. So we see echoes of this happening today, and we need to be the ones to help connect the dots so that we continue to motivate a new generation and let them understand that this is their leg of the race to run. Thank you. Reverend Barber. As monstrous as this decision is, I meet it with a cheerful spirit, for I know that every attempt to allay the abolition movement has only served to embolden and intensify our agitation. This was the words of Frederick Douglass in the 1800s when the Dred Scott decision was voted, and some people said abolition was over the Supreme Court had been stacked with slave thinking Supreme Court justices. And the decision was bad. And we didn't have the votes. And at first, Frederick Douglass was dismayed like many others, but then he did a speech two months later. He laid out how ugly it was, how monstrous it was. But then he said, could this be a necessary link in the chain of events towards the downfall of the entire system of slavery. He reinterpreted the narrative to see that it was actually possible that the attack would reveal the strength of the abolition movement and not the weakness. That the attack, that the re way they were attacking the movement. And so we've had a thousand bills, over a thousand voter suppression bills since the Shelby decision. The attack is saying how strong we are. In South Africa, they used to say a, a dying mule uh, 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 kicks the hardest. We've got to rethink that nobody would be attacking us like this if voting and our possibility wasn't powerful. There are five interlocking injustices right now. 
systemic racism, I think that you can best see through voter suppression uh, that's impacting this democracy, systemic poverty, 135 million poor and low-wage people in this country, 295,000 people dying a year from poverty, 800 people a day, 60% of black people are poor and low wealth, 26 million people, 30% of white people are poor and low wealth, 66 million people. Uh, ecological devastation, denial of health care, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. We first have got to understand we're in a crisis of civilization, a crisis of democracy. And it's hard. Democracy is hard. You have to work for it. You fight for it. One of the things the Koch brothers said in the 80s that in, in a private meeting that later was transcribed, they said that the problem with, they said certain progressives, that we keep looking for a messiah candidate. We, and then they said, but we're going to build a movement and not look for a messiah candidate. So here we are, 2013, Shelby decision. Basically, they walked back across the bridge. Only one vote since 2013 in Congress to restore the Voting Rights Act. And when that happened, Democrats were in control of the Senate and the House in 2020. Two Democrats blocked. Manchin and Sinema joined 50 Republicans to say no to the restoration of the Voting Rights Act, that if they had voted yes, a black woman named Kamala Harris would have had the deciding vote. Now, I believe that we can no longer go to Selma, and I love my sister, because you remember she said, we go down there to reconnect, not to commemorate. Mm -hmm. Commemoration ain't worth a damn. If you are commemorating something people stole from you, what we need is not commemoration, but re-engagement. We should be launching, and I say this to the civil rights groups that have, should be launching a movement from Selma every year. Not a commemoration. Not a commemoration. Before we march with any president across that bridge, we should ask that president or those Congress people, where are you on restoring the Voting Rights Act? Where are you on expanding voting rights in the 21st century? The next time we go down next year, we should actually walk backwards. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't act like it's okay. There's a place which you have to not act like it's okay. We, we, we think about it. In any other country, people would be in the streets in D.C. all the time. What would happen if every church and every group in D.C. was constantly doing engagement and nonviolent civil disobedience on the steps of Congress until we passed the restoration of the Voting Rights Act? There's a, there's a sense in which we have got to become dissatisfied at what we are seeing and not accept it as being okay, not accept it as normal. Commemorations actually, actually, to tell the truth, you don't commemorate prophets and prophetic movement. You find out where they died. You go there, you pick up the baton and carry it the next mile of the way. And it's not just last of the Voting Rights Act, it's expanding uh, voting rights. So let me tell you a quick story. In 2008, the story came out, and I'm going to say some things that may be interesting. Uh, you 20, 2008, it came out that President Obama won North Carolina, right? He won North Carolina, Virginia, and Florida. Actually, he did not win North Carolina. He lost North Carolina. What happened was, in 2007, our movement, the Forward Together movement, fought even Democrats to force a vote to expand same-day registration and early voting in North Carolina, something that they don't even have in New York. We won that in the South. And when we did, we were able to push a million new voters to the polls through same-day registration and expanded early voting. So President Obama lost on election day but he won by 140 votes per county in the early vote period. We, we fought. That's, and it was after that that we began to see all of this, this fight because they saw what could happen. If you actually expand the vote, you can break through the Southern strategy. You can win in the South. In, in, in 2010, the conservative extremist Tea Party legislature won a majority. The first thing they wanted to do was pass um, uh, 
voter ID, but a white Democrat woman governor vetoed them, and they couldn't overcome the veto. But they passed a gerrymandering plan. Now watch this. We argued that the gerrymandering plan was racist, and we went to the holder attorney general's office and said, do not approve this plan. Later, we would prove in the courts that it was racist, some seven years later. But the administration at that time approved that plan. They approved that plan. And, and so in 2012, with a unconstitutionally constituted gerrymandering plan, the extremists won a supermajority. And then with that supermajority that they won in 2012, in 2013, they attacked women, they attacked gay people, they attacked uh, immigrants, they attacked living wages, they attacked unemployment. And uh, in, during Holy Week, Holy Week of 2013, they passed the bill and the computer thought the bill was so bad, it named it Senate Bill 666. I kid you not, the, it kicked it out. And it was a bill that gutted 40 parts of our voting rights in North Carolina. Then they tabled that bill and passed House Bill 589, 87, and, and, and made it a photo ID bill, and then said, now we're going to wait to see if the headache was been, will be removed. And on June 25th, 2013, the headache was removed. One of the senators said that the headache has been removed. And that's when they passed the worst voter suppression. But here's the thing. If that voter gerrymandering bill had never been approved under Section 5, Section 5 had not been gutted in 2010. It got approved. We later on won against it, but it first got approved when Section 5. We cannot have laws and then have the, not have the courage to stand on them. And, ho and fight back against the things that are happening. You're, you're saying something that's interesting to me. You, you, you mentioned before going up to people running for office and how are you going to defend voting rights and the democracy in the 21st century? Reminds me of a document I saw in 2020 from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences called Our Common Purpose, where they spent 10 years talking to 15,000 Americans from all different cultural, spiritual, socioeconomic backgrounds and asking them how do they want to improve democracy. One of the things they came up with was expanding the number of members in the House of Representatives because now I believe it's 750,000 constituents per House member. That's impossible to represent all of that. But they also said a few things. Registering to vote high school sophomores and juniors. Expanding the vote the general election voting day to three days, ranked choice voting. Some of these things I feel like are evolutionary steps in bringing our vote in. But here we are. We have states across the country, but primarily in the South, which are, is it fair to say that everyone's fighting to see who's the best at voter suppression between these states in the South? Texas is trying to be Tennessee, who's trying to be Florida in this. What is it going to take, seeing that we have a lot at stake in this election in 2024? What is it going to take to wake people up so that we don't just commemorate, but we take action and get involved in the things? Janae. So a lot of what you just described, same-day voter registration, extended early voting, a lot of the things, automatic voter registration that makes voting easy, that makes voting just a common sense civic exercise, which is what it should be in a democracy, are features of the Freedom to Vote Act. And so as much as we talk about restoring the Voting Rights Act, which is absolutely essential, that's just baseline, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act must get passed. It must get passed, and it not only restores Section 5, but it adds in other provisions that modernizes our current uh, election protection system and makes it go beyond just southern states, which were the primary targets of the Voting Rights Act, not, not the exclusive ones, even New York State, where I'm from, uh, was actually covered by the Voting Rights Act, and Section 5 in particular. But the Freedom to Vote Act and the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act complement one another and fill so many of the gaps that we see in our election system. So it takes care of issues like gerrymandering 
and bans partisan gerrymandering. Partisan gerrymandering, I hope we have a chance to get into that, is something that is abused and used to divide Black voters, to separate them, to manipulate them in every possible way uh, in order to gain partisan advantage. And it is Black voters who are just distinctly used as pawns in that, in that political process. Can you explain to the audience how bad of a problem that is? Oh, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem because what the Supreme Court did uh, in, a, in a case a few years ago uh, called Rucho is say that Rucho versus Common Cause, is, it said that partisan gerrymandering is perfectly lawful, that it is okay for a party, Republican, Democrat, and we're nonpartisan, so we don't care who does it. We believe no one should manipulate voters for party advantage. You know, people describe it in many different ways, that it's effectively having elected officials choose their voters. That, that completely corrupts the process. And if you believe that what you stand for, that the positions that you are advancing are that worthwhile and are, are that popular, then you should be able to win on the merit of those positions alone. Instead, what we see is that parties are carving up states and carving up districts in ways that pretty much guarantee a partisan advantage. And the voters that they use to execute that strategy are black voters in particular. Other voters sometimes, but they rely on black voters um, in ways that are deeply nefarious and that often are covered by this veneer of partisanship when really at bottom, it's about racial gerrymandering as well. And so while racial gerrymandering is unlawful, partisan gerrymandering is not, and that's why you see this fuzzy mix between the two, because they're trying to use partisan gerrymandering to cover racial discrimination. But the Freedom to Vote Act helps to fix that. It says that partisan gerrymandering is unlawful. And so when we talk about how we can mobilize people and get them energized this election, in my view, this election will decide whether we have a democracy for the, for the next generation, if not more. And that what we have to do is elect a Congress that will pass these laws in order to be able to deal with any of the other rights that we care deeply about. You know, the Supreme Court said in 1886 that the right to vote is preservative of all rights. And so whether you agree with one, you know, with someone on one issue or another issue, to me is wholly irrelevant. If you don't have the right to vote to even contest this in a democracy, then whatever issue you care most about is really up to someone else to decide if you don't seize the right to vote, if you don't seize control of how districts are drawn, if you don't ensure that you can bring a lawsuit to vindicate your rights and not have to rely on the Department of Justice to do it. So there's a lot at stake that is coming through these particular bills, and that should be the number one motivating factor for people who care about anything else in this country. Let me, okay. sir. W.B. Du Bois said the right to vote is the only thing that protects us from another slavery. And so Janelle just raised something, counselor, I mean call her, our counselor just raised something. No, no, you are a counselor, though I want you to be all that here, hey Roland, is that we have to don't make sure that these bills don't get dumbed down. So the freedom to act, John Lewis, is one thing, but now see Manchin pulled the trick. Manchin when he voted against the bill, he then went into conference with some people. He, he offered amendments and still didn't vote for the amendment. Do you know in the amended bill, they codify photo ID across the country and allow states the right to do it? We can't be supporting stuff like that. They codify. We got to look at, we, we want the original John Lewis bill. And we have to fight for that and do agitation for that and demand that the Legislative Black Caucus and Progressive Caucus stand on that because you can actually get a bill that sets you backwards. The second thing we have to do is realize that many Southern states are not blue or red, they're unorganized. We've never really seen an election of our full power. So one of the things we're doing now in the Poor People's Campaign, we are now have a campaign to touch 15 million poor and low-wage infrequent voters because we did a study called Waking the Sleeping Giant. Here's what we found out. That in, in battleground states, poor and low-wage people now make up 36 to 45% of the electorate. 
There is not a state in this country where if 20% of poor and low-wage voters who did not vote were to vote, that they could not change the outcomes. The number one reason they're not voting is not uh, voter suppression, is nobody talks to them. Nobody's connecting voting rights to living wages, voting rights to education, voting rights to health care. They don't talk to them. And when you talk to them, you see change. We went and organized in Kentucky. We never were partisan. We saw four counties flip from red to blue, and now Kentucky has a, a progressive government. But people, with it, and talk to them. We have power. Somebody say power. And I want to show you all some of the power. When we, for instance, in Georgia, the number of eligible voters who did not cast a ballot in 2020 is 1,076,000. The margin of victory was 11,000. The number in Florida, the number of poor, number of eligible poor and low wealth voters who did not vote was 2.8 million. The margin of victory was 300,000. In Texas, the margin of victory, the number of eligible voters that, that did not vote poor and low wealth is 3.3 million. The margin of victory was 631,000. In North Carolina, it was 170,000 votes. The margin was a mil the, the number of people that didn't vote was a million. In Michigan, it was 10,000 votes. The number of folk poor and low wealth that didn't vote was a million. Selinda Lake, who's a powerful uh, 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 poster, is telling people that any party or any political enterprise that is not talking to poor and low-wage voters is suicidal because poor and low-wage voters now have a power to reshape elections across this country. It's, it, Actually, what has happened is a God thing. The stone that the builders rejected now have the power to be the cornerstone. But we don't hear this on this news. If, if Roland doesn't talk about it, you don't hear it on, on cable, you don't hear it on CNN. They don't even talk about poor and low-wealth voters. They don't talk about the power of low-wealth voters. 72% of Americans want a living wage. 60-plus percent want, want health care. 60% of Republicans now in Mississippi want health care. If we start running and connecting, the other night the president at his State of the Union said America needs a, a raise. We haven't had a raise in the minimum wage since 2009. If he were to say, and others, and I'm not arguing for, I'm not campaigning, but I'm just talking politics, were to say, listen, elect us and we guarantee you a living wage of at least $15 an hour, $17 an hour, voted on and passed in the first 50 days of a new administration, you would see a shift in the electorate. Because remember Dr. King's warning, the greatest fear of the racist oligarchy in this country is for the masses of poor, the masses of Negroes and the masses of poor white folk to come together and form a voting bloc that would shift the economic architecture. We have to connect the two and we have power. P lastly, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and North Carolina. The margin of victory in those four states in 2020 was about 270,000 votes. Four million poor and low-wage voters did not vote. But the number one reason they did not vote is nobody talks to them. Fifteen presidential debates and the poor weren't mentioned one time. You said something very interesting. I just want to say we talk about poor people on This Is Nashville. I, I, I specifically make it a point to talk about poor white people on This Is Nashville because a lot of times when they say these are the problems that are affecting black and brown folks, I'm like poor white folks, particularly in the majority. two and a half years I've lived in Tennessee, I see poor white folks are going through the same thing as well. But you said something interesting that politicians, elected officials have a tough time expressing these ideas to their constituents. Say for the young man Everybody oh, else a has tough a tough time, time doing it, except for him. Yeah. You know, so I want to ask you this, Representative Jones: How do you go out and educate and talk to your constituents and people who may not even be in your district, so that they are aware of these issues, and so they're better armed to go out there and to do something about it? I think one thing that we're seeing in Tennessee is that people. Um, in our state have been waiting for fighters. They've been waiting for people to be bold and do things out of the ordinary. Um, Rev quoted Frederick Douglass, and my favorite quote says that those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are people who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the terrible roars of its, of its waters. 
this struggle may be a moral one or it may be a physical one, but it must be a struggle because power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out what a man will submit to and you'll find the exact amount of injustice that will be imposed upon him. And, and I work in a building every day where you, you, you just go in to get beat. You go in to be put before a spectacle. This week is actually the one-year anniversary of me being expelled because we dared to stand up. And I remember my first week in the legislature, um, I had a, actually had a white suit. I was excited. I was, you know, going to committee. I, I'd done what people said could not be, could not be done. They said, you know, um, you're too young to run. And, th and this is an issue we have in Tennessee. 70% of our seats in the state house were unchallenged last election. 70% of the seats, no one ran for them. And, and what we're told as young people is that you need to wait your turn. But what a poll just came out recently in the news that said that when young people run, young pe um, other young people are 61% more likely to vote. Because That's you have people who will speak to the issue, speak with the urgency and the moral clarity and boldness that they want to see in our politics. And so people are looking for fighters. And I think that is, is what we have to do is that um, I've traveled through the state in the past year a lot. And, and I, I don't know where Chandler is. My chief is that we were in um, Manchester, Tennessee, um, getting some food. And this man came in with a... Um, camouflage hat looked like Duck Dynasty. And, and, and he said, you're a fighter. I like that. Mm -hmm. I support that. Because people want people who they know who are authentic. Every time we go around this city, people are saying, thank you for fighting for us. Because for so long, we've had people who put title above their purpose of why they're there. And they want not power for their people, but they want proximity to power. I was telling the story about my first week in the legislature. I was getting on the elevator, and State Senator Jack Johnson, this was my welcome to the legislature. He said, Jones, I just want you to know that you're worthless, and you don't belong here. And that was clarifying for me. It was, it was jarring. I didn't know how to respond to it. But as I thought about it, I said, this is clarifying because I'm not here to make friends with these people. I'm here to make change for my district and to do it unapologetically. And when we got expelled last year, members of my own party, members of my own caucus said, Go up and apologize, yep. and maybe they'll be merciful to you. And I thought of the young people who stood before and sat down as a way to stand up. I, I thought of my own grandmother whose family had to leave the South to go to Chicago fleeing the violence here. I thought and talked to Rev. I talked to uh, Sherilyn. I thought, that, you know, a lot of people thought we had all these people around us, but we did not have anybody here. We were isolated, left alone by our own party, by our own caucus, by our own leadership. But it's in moments like that that we realize that something out of the ordinary is happening. That, you know, we talk about Holy Week. I also was in Divinity School with Carla for a little bit before I ran for office, my friend here. Um, and, and they expelled us during Holy Week. You know, the day before Good Friday, we were, and I came back the day after Easter. And I think that there's something, there's something not coincidental about that, that there is some revival happening here, that every time they try and crucify democracy, we, we, we have a witness. We, we have a form of resistance, and we refuse to be bowed and broken, and we refuse to be made an example of. And so I think, my, to answer your question, is that people are looking for people who they know are authentic, who will speak for them, who will fight for them, even if it means getting gaveled out of order. You know, um, I think this session alone, I've been out of order 20 times, which means they censure you, they take a vote, you can't speak, you can't speak. And, and we're in a state where they have a supermajority, and, and they, they're all powerful, they think. And, and, and I like to think to myself that they have a supermajority, so we know how the vote will go, but we are all equal in federal court. We're all equal in federal court, which is why right now the speaker and me, we're in a lawsuit suing the Speaker of the House for suppressing the votes of the people of my district, for silencing the, the votes of the people of my district. And so we must continue to use litigation, agitation, whatever we can, whatever tools we can. And, and my message to the people here, too, is um, don't be afraid of these ideas that these young people have. Sometimes it may not look like what it looked like in the black and white photos back in the day. But, but it's needed. Sometimes it means getting dragged out the Capitol. Sometimes it means when they shut off your microphone, pulling out a megaphone out your pocket. That's what it looks like sometimes. But we have to do it because everything we love is at stake. And so I'm so excited to see more young people run. I've been saying this across the nation. I, you know, Southern segregationists would always say that the South will rise again. And I, I reject that. I rebuke that and say the South will rise anew. A new South is rising. That is multiracial. We reject the authoritarianism of Billy and Cameron Sexton. And we represent a, a, a resistance and alternative to that. 
And I take my oath seriously as a legislator that as a lawmaker in Tennessee, we take an oath that says, I refuse, I will protest against any legislation that is injurious to the people. I will dissent from and protest against any legislation that is injurious to the people. And that is a, a oath, that is a covenant with our constituents. And we take that seriously. Can I make a point? Thank you. One, one real quick, like 10 yes, seconds. One point and I got one okay. last question. Great. Did you hear him say all of these people that had no competition? We got to break that up. Run. See, we're getting told we can't win. People believe the lie, these consultants. We don't know what we can win because we've not run yet. We've not inspired a whole lot of people who are not voting. So first of all, run. Get in the fight. And then the second thing, when he said about how you were treated, when we did Mall Monday, we were told not to do it, even by some civil rights group. We maintained it for two years, and we won. We actually sent a extremist governor home in 2014 in a state they said was impossible to do so by mobilizing 10% of voters that had not voted and being strategic about it. We're in a time where we've got to look at the strategy because everything we're seeing now did not come with a Trump. It, it, it's not, it didn't just happen like boom, it was a plan. The Southern strategy in the 60s said, if we can engage in intentional polarization, we can split the nation. They said it might get out of hand. If it does, we'll lie and say we didn't do it. But they said if we split the nation, we can control the nation from Maryland to Arizona, and we can build up a revolution. If they plan the division, we can plan the unity. If they plan, you see, this was a plan. What we're existing in right now was planned. Trump's election, uh, the extremists taking over, supermajority, it was all a plan. They looked at the data and they planned. If we start looking at the new data, we can plan and see change and make change happen. That's what has to happen, I think. And Yeah, thank you. And as we talk about that, I just want to build on, on something that Brother Justin said. The, the young people are so inspired by leaders like you. And one, I just want to thank you for, for persevering, for being as resilient as you are. You are inspiring people across the nation. This is not just a Tennessee issue. You are emblematic of the future that we are all fighting for. And I know it takes courage. I know that it can wear you down. I just want you to know that we appreciate you and we recognize the sacrifice that you're making. And, and, and it, it's, it's, it's people like Justin, it's the young people in my life who, who let me know that we are at this crossroads moment where we can have a refounding of this democracy, right? We're not here just to save it. We're here to make it actually work for us in a totally different way. We're not here just to save it and preserve what was the status quo before. We need to use this moment to transform it. And, and when you have these moments of tectonic shifts, that's when you can break open something completely new and imaginary. And that's what I think the younger people who are leading this way are doing, but it doesn't absolve the rest of us from being part of this fight at all. And so I don't want to create a, a youth versus older folks uh, dichotomy, because that's not it at all. But we should understand the numbers. So one, there is tremendous power in the South. Most black people, as you all know, live in the South. 57% of eligible black voters live in the South. 57%. So when you talk about all those numbers and these, and I know you're talking not just about black voters, but all low wealth voters and poor voters, there's tremendous untapped you have somehow got to seize. And then if we're thinking about the polarization of the electorate and what it looks like right now demographically, about 37% of the electorate are people who begin at uh, millennials and then go down to Gen Z, Gen X, all that, all that folks. And then the other 37% are baby boomers and above. So there's a real tug of war happening in this country for our democracy. And there are so many barriers stacked against young people in particular. We've got to help galvanize that vote and help them, one, overcome the barriers, but appreciate what is at stake. And it is really their future because the baby boomers are on their way out. And they're trying to calcify a certain hierarchy and power that will keep certain people in power. But we have the numbers. We've got the changing demographics. Demographics are not destiny. 
but we can chart that destiny if we put the right investment in getting people out to the polls. And one investment is having people like you that we can look up to, that can inspire people. And that's such an important ingredient to the transformation that we're trying to achieve. So thank you. You know, I, I want to ask this. I mean, Representative Jones is inspiring people. Reverend Barber is inspiring people. But you are inspiring a lot of young movement attorneys. There's some in the house here who are working to do that. What are your words for them as we face this stage in attempting to save our democracy? But as you said, the charge is not just all solely to save it, but to ensure that it thrives and that it evolves, given what we're facing a few months away in November. What would you say? What, what, are, your, what are your words to all of the young aspiring movement attorneys in the House? <laughs> so we've talked a lot about uh, the voice and the vote and and. The reason I told you from the very beginning that I wasn't all that jazzed about voting, it actually didn't seem like the most exciting thing I could be working on as a civil rights lawyer. Um, but the more I came to appreciate what it does, that it is a currency that we all possess in equal measure, and that's, that's rare in this country. I mean, yes, we know that when we cast a ballot, there are ways in, in which systemic racism is superimposed and how it's counted and all of that. But at least from the very start, we each have one, one vote. Every person who's eligible has one vote and can cast it in equal measure with someone else. And so it is that possibility of equity that really excites me about voting. And when I do the work in communities trying to galvanize them, uh, centering their stories and, and telling them about how those rights connect to the many others that they cherish and centering their stories at, in that process is really what movement lawyering is about. It's helping to amplify the voices of disenfranchised communities. It's being the strategic partner with your client, not seeing them as someone that you are you know, imparting wisdom to, but as someone who is part of the strategy of challenging laws. They may not have the legal education I have, but they, I also may not have the particular lived experience that they have. And you need both, and they are both equally valuable to deliver the change that we seek. And at the Legal Defense Fund, we try to bring cases that will not only vindicate the rights of individuals, but that will leave a, an impact and create precedent that will inure to the benefit of a broader community. And that's part of movement learning as well, thinking about the whole as, as something much greater than than the individuals that you represent. And so I encourage anyone who's thinking about movement lawyering to attach yourself to an organization that is doing this type of work to make sure that you are always centering your clients in the conversation, you're consulting with them every step of the way, and that you're also talking to your partners and peers in the movement so that we are coming at these complex problems from different angles with different strategies because it is a, a, a conundrum. I mean, this is, this is not an easy uh, uh, thing to tackle. There's, there are centuries compounded laws that are meant to continue the subjugation of people and black people in particular, and it requires a very multifaceted um, uh, set of tools to attack it. And so that's part of what movement lawyering is. It's the protest, it's the litigation, it's the research, it's the public education, and it's the narrative, it's communications. It's, it's telling people stories in ways that can motivate and inspire them. I want to thank you all so much. Can I say one little yes, benediction? <laughs> we have also got to say to people we vote for, our votes are not for personality, they are for demands. And when we elect you, imagine we wouldn't even be having a conversation about, say, Trump, I can say that, if not only with a COVID uh, recovery bill we had passed that, but if we had also passed living wages and voting rights. Eight moderate Democrats joined 50 Republicans and voted against living wages. When President Biden and, and, and Vice President Kamala were running, they ran on living wages and voting rights. 54% of people making less than $50,000 a year voted for them. 
54% of people, not black. We, we, we've got to come to a place where you don't run on one thing and then get elected and do something else, right? Because people get, they, they, they get to despair. You know, we could end poverty with about four or five pieces of legislation today. Um, we, 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 got, we have 800 people dying a day from poverty. When seven people died from vaping, it was a White House uh, uh, a level conversation. It was congressional hearings. Black people make up 60% of black people are poor and low wealth. How is addressing poverty and low wealth not at the top of our agenda as we connect it to voting rights? Not just black businesses, but dealing with black poverty. We passed a uh, child tax credit and for six months, ended child, eradicated 6% of child poverty and then threw people right back into poverty. We've got to stop this ebb and flow. And those of us who have power and you, I've got to start saying that our votes are demands. We're not just voting for a democracy. We're voting for the kind of democracy we want. The kind of democracy where people have health care and public education, living wages, where love trumps hate. But then the last thing I want to say is a matter of benediction. You, when, when you're given power, you have to use it. And... We can't forget extremism lost in 2020. Now, it didn't lose but by about 48,000 votes in three states, but it lost at the highest level. It lost. We got to own that. And we have to own that a lot of the folk that are, are, are loud aren't necessarily strong, that we have a strength. And when it comes to a giant, since I'm a preacher, what I've learned about giants from the Bible is you don't need a whole lot of rocks. You need placement. It's not, you don't need 20 rocks. You need one with the right placement. So, so what we're doing in the poor people's county, we decided, okay, if poor and low wage voters represent 36 to 45% of the electorate in battleground states, then why not we organize 200 people in every state, we need 200 in Tennessee, that will learn how to do voter mobilization using technology and the old way of walking the turf. And if you take 200 people times 35 states, times six days a week, times four people a day, times nine weeks, you can touch 17 million voters. 17 million voters in eight weeks, actually. And if you do that between now and November, that means you can touch them four times. And most a lot of the studies say if you touch infrequent voters twice, they move. If we have the right placement of our strength, the giants of oppression and racism fall. It's not how many rocks we have. It's the placement. And so I want us to leave here fighting for the restoration of the Voting Rights Act, fighting for the Freedom to Vote Act, the original one, but also saying, that we are going to pick up these rocks, that we are not going to allow millions of, that, of infrequent poor and low-wage voters that have this power to sit on the sideline. Because you don't even need 80%. You don't even need 30%. There's not a state where if 20% of poor and low-wage voters that have not voted were to be placed in a movement, and were to vote for movement value that they could not fundamentally shift. If the oligarchy is afraid of poor and low-wage voters mobilizing, then let's realize their fear. Mm -hmm. Yes, And sir. show them what it looks like. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Representative Justin Jones, Reverend William Barber, Counselor Janae Nelson. Thank you all so much really thank you this, before I'm we, sorry we went over okay. before we exit the stage i want to turn it back over to ashley who has a couple of questions from our law students um, before we exit the stage thank you so much to all of our esteemed panelists um, you know there are undergraduate students and law students who are are in the audience and you talked a little bit about what roles 
uh, they can play kind of moving the needle from tonight's discussion. Um, we also talked about language choices. And one of the questions was, if love can defeat fear, how do you start to create a narrative that's rooted in love that can reach people and combat the politics of fear, understanding the uh, constraints of either being in the legal profession or for others who aren't going to be in the legal profession in their own professions? I think that's a question we can all, we can all answer that one. You want to say it again? Sure. So if love can defeat fear, how can we begin to create a narrative that's rooted in love that can reach people and combat the politics of fear? Well, speaking to someone in the media, tell the truth. First of all, no, don't be afraid yourself to share that narrative and tell the truth and focus in on the human being of it all. That's something that we try to do at This Is Nashville is focus on the human. Politics sometimes change. The politics of 2024 is not the politics of 70 years ago, and it won't be the politics of 70 years from now. But right now, we're here at this singular moment, and I believe you have to talk to human beings. And now we live in a world through social media, through, through um, let's say, people being attacked for what they say, for sharing their beliefs, where it's easy to, the Reverend was talking about, you know, giants and well-placed rocks because it's easy to, to, to get people to cow. If I say something and it's not agreed upon, suddenly people will attack me. I will lose my job. I'll lose my livelihood. In some cases, people could potentially lose their lives. That can't stop you. If love truly can overcome fear, that can't stop you. Particularly now, you have to go out. And it's a level of, um, I, I see and I talk about this with, with colleagues and friends a lot, a level of sacrifice that I think people have to have to be willing to make in order to 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 share not just not just the narrative but the story because it is the truth. Share those truths. I think that's I have nothing to add to that really. I mean it's it's absolutely true. Um, the picture that we we try to paint at LDF is that of a multiracial democracy where dignity is sacred power is shared, and thriving is the standard. That is inclusive of everybody. That is for everybody. And I think when we understand that, A, we have a linked fate, that if this democracy goes down, we're all going down with it, right? And there are some people who, who would rather destroy it than share it. We can recognize that. But, that. but that really needs to be understood by those people who don't want it destroyed, but have to see that by suppressing the vote by suppressing voices by continuing this pattern of subjugation that there's no winning in the long run and that also someone else's freedom doesn't necessarily mean a diminishment of yours right i mean it doesn't take anything away from me to have someone love who they want to love or have someone have you know this freedoms that are going to make them whole and happy as a human and those are the types of stories that we need to tell um, I was talking to someone recently about the, you know, the idea that social media has become so very, very toxic. But then I also noticed, you know, people flock to these little puppy stories and these little hopeful memes and, you know, the hero stories. I think at our core, we truly are, most of us, good. And, and, and humans really do want to connect with one another and do want um, uh, to, to uplift and, they, and, and many have been brainwashed to think that it is a zero-sum calculus. So that's something we have to break open and say that there's enough pie for everyone. Yeah. I, I was sitting there thinking um, justice is what love looks like in public. And, but part of what we have to do is scare people to love. You remember you said I'm scared to life, scared to, 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 to life. And I don't mean scare like, like that. I mean that, you know, Roland does this thing called unfiltered. We need some unfiltered truth. You know, in a time of live truth, telling the truth is the most radical thing you can do. And part of what we have to do is you don't need a movement if everything is fine. So part of what a movement has to do is show how deadly the fear is, 
how deadly the politics of fear is. We have to show what policy murder looks like, that it's not benign, that the same people that oppress voting rights, oppress living wages, same people oppress living wages, oppress public education, same people that suppress public education, suppress health care, and all of those suppressions have a death measurement. You, you you gotta show so that and you said remember that's morbid but watch this you remember when the young man fell out on the football field what two years ago my was his name but Mar Hamlin, Lamar Hamlin. Yeah. and everybody saw it right and it scared us and everybody started giving to his foundation people were praying I I was called by players and I didn't even know that they listened to my sermon and they asked me to do a prayer for the, for the players and write it, and they put it in 60 languages. But something dawned on me, when folks saw that, it moved. Same with George. Well, we got to do the same thing with policy. We're, we're allowing the, the narrative and the political conversations to be too benign. We're not making folk have to really address the deadliness. You know, I, I'm going to say it again until you all just say it. 800 folk dying a day from poverty. 295,000 people a year from poverty. That is unnecessary. In the 21st century, we are going to have to drive that and show. That's why one of the things to push a love narrative, you got to put impact the people at the mic. I get criticized at our rallies. I've had so-called national leaders say, Reverend Bob, you come to D.C., and when you all have your rallies, you don't let the leaders speak. I say, yes, we do. The leaders are the impact of people because you've got to put a face on the numbers, a face on the death, because something about that draws out love out of people, but you've got to show people just how ugly the fear is and how deadly policies rooted in fear are. I think, you know, here, Reverend Barber share that is something connected to love is grief. Grief is love in the condition of absence. And so an act of love is to grieve what we're seeing around us. We're seeing not only people that, but we're seeing a collapse all around us in our environment um, of systems. We see what's happening um, abroad. And so I think um, when I think of love, I think, and, and someone who acted irregardless of the fear is, is, is Ida B. Wells, who was here in Tennessee, who talked about telling the unvarnished truth, um, who, who, we had a statue outside our state capitol of a man who tried, a newspaper editor who tried to instigate lynchings against her, violence against her, but she still continued to tell the truth. And so when we think about love amidst the fear, think about how much love it took to get us to this place right here. You know, think of, think of the love of, of not even just the names that we know in history, but the names of people in our own families, grandma, the indignities that she had to endure, our own relatives, you know, think about that love. And I think that love will not overcome fear, but I think walking toward the fear is an act of love when you're going to do it. You know, when I thought of Diane Nash, who, who said we wrote out our wills, but we were ready to pay the ultimate price, that was an act of love. And so what if we were to write a letter today to future generations, what are we willing to risk? What are we willing to do that is going to put some, something at stake um, and, and be outside of our comfort zone and, and may cost something? And I think that's something we have to think about. But I think um, love is an action, and I think love is solidarity. I think love is showing up. I think love is, is putting ourselves in the, you know, in the midst of harm sometimes and, and trying to be a buffer for those who we care about um, and, and standing together arm in arm um, and, and willing to turn over some tables as well when we need to. And so. On that note, please join me in thanking our phenomenal moderator and speakers. Thank you all so much for coming. To our attorneys who are in the audience, we get CLE credit for being uh -oh. here today. So uh -oh. we will leave the um, CLE list as you exit. I also want to acknowledge Roland Martin, journalist extraordinaire who just um, joined us. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, and if you could, those of you who are available tomorrow, please join us at the um, voting rights roundtable at Vanderbilt Law School, where we will continue this conversation. Thank you. <laughs>